It's a slice of life R on 938 Live and I'm Eugene Lowe. Today we find out more about the transformational power of choice theory psychology from hypnotherapist Nathaniel Sears, who himself admits uh, that his life was changed because of the practice of choice theory. He first tells us about the originator of this concept, Dr. William Glasser. He developed the system in 1970. Uh, he's a renowned a psychiatrist back. a while back. Okay. So what he did was he teach this concept uh, to the whole world mm. on the basis that you are always in charge. You always have a choice. Then from the basis of choice theory, he developed uh, reality therapy where you can use certain platforms, certain techniques where you can actually ask the patient or the client on how to become better in their life. So choosing is the basic background of how choice theory is. I see. So it's a tool for self-empowerment. Uh, not only for self-empowerment, it can also be used in a uh, platform of counselling, for therapy, for even uh, self-help. Uh, in Singapore, uh, choice theory is also practiced in many areas, including some schools as well. Um, if I recall, uh, certain prisons in the States are practicing it. Right. Okay. So if I understand it correctly, uh, does it essentially teach uh, one that uh, they have control over their lives and they, they, they don't have to feel or behave like victims? Um, that's one thing as well. Now, at the end of the day, choice theory based on the platform that you are always in control. Even though we may be living in an environment of external control. For example, uh, in an environment of, um, let's say, when you look at driving, you see a red light, you stop. Uh, as a child, when you study, if you did something, you didn't finish your homework, the parents will scold you, the teacher will uh, punish you and so forth. So we are always in the external control environment. However, choice theory based on the basis that you are always internally motivated. You always have a choice. So you can either choose to, for example, when there's a red light, you can choose to run the red light. Uh, of course, you'll get summoned along the way. Lah. Then, you, of course, if you do, don't do your homework, you get punished. Or you can choose to do your homework and get better at grades as well. Mm. So it's always about choice. You always have choice. Right. Okay. So you were introduced to this choice theory uh, psychology via that book, is it? By uh, Dr. Oh. William Glasser. The book called Take Charge of Your Life, uh, How to Get What You Need, with choice theory is one is actually his last book before he passed on. So the concept of choice theory was actually been around for a long time. I was actually introduced to it about ten years ago, but I didn't pursue it until about three years ago when I was in California. So when I went, I saw this opportunity was there. Decided to go and meet the developer who developed the system. At the same time, learn from both. Dr. William Glasser, as well as his wife, Colleen Glasser, and right, okay. uh, went through the certification. It began to show me ways and means to improve both my life as well as the people around me. And uh, I decided to pursue further, went through a different area of certification, from basic to advanced to finally getting the certification and becoming a reality therapy. It took me about two and a half years. I see. So you actually trained under Glasser himself. Yes, I started with uh, Glasser, then from there, different supervisor and so forth to finally certification. Okay. So can you give us, uh, can you tell us what you, what you learned about choice theory while you were there? What did I learn from choice theory? <laughs> Too much to share, I suppose, within uh, half an hour or the scope of this show. But uh, just give us, uh, I suppose, an overview sure. of the various uh, concepts or lessons being taught in choice theory. Okay. Uh, I did mention before that we live in an external control environment. So when we are in an external control environment, um, there are many ways that it affects our life. Uh, for example, we had mentioned earlier about the red light, uh, the child, and so forth. We always have choice. And to the point where external control becomes a norm, until the point where, let's say, you experience a uh, certain feeling of in a relationship that it didn't work out, you start blaming on others because you think that everything is based on external control. Or you become very resigned and say, oh, like, c'est la vie, right? I mean, that's just the way it is, things like Correct. that. And yeah. you begin to blame others for the things that happen, begin to criticize and so forth. So there are certain disconnecting habits that actually affects our life. Now, what church theory does is it lets you understand that we are all internally motivated. So you can always decide at a point of time to choose your life. 
to change it in the way that you want to be. Okay. They are also a uh, basis of uh, understanding how and what drives you. We have a set of what you call a uh, quality world picture. Uh, it's based on what we want. And our one is derived from our basic needs. So choice theory also talk about uh, the five basic needs. Um, our need for survival, when you need to, uh, when you're hungry, you, you eat. When you need to sleep, you, you get a nap. Or let's say, for example, you need to release your bowel, you go to the toilet. So the survival need will always be there. Well, that is basically physiological needs. And you have the other four needs, which includes, uh, it's based on, psych, uh, based on psychological needs, which includes a need for love and belonging. Because as humans, we are social creatures, so we always need to be around, to feel belong, and so forth. Uh, the other three, that includes a sense of power and achievement. Uh, because of competition, we always wanted to become better at what we can do. So power is there, and the other two needs includes freedom and fun. Now, freedom, uh, no one wants to be controlled. So when you reach a point where you are controlled in your daily life, the way that you eat, the way that you sleep, the way that you walk, it makes you feel very restrictive and to the point where you will start rebelling. So freedom is important and of course fun uh, by creating new things, learning new things. So once you have these four basic needs there is there, it fulfill your wants. And your wants will, will start help uh, basing on your basic needs. You will, you will form that in your uh, quality world picture. So your quality world picture could be, let's say, maybe uh, a child uh, wanting to spend more time with the parents. But the parents both are working. So they are, he's not been fulfilled in the area of their love and belong needs. So the child will start acting out in ways like, for example, um, becoming more naughty, uh, start throwing tantrum and things like that. So in order to draw the attention from the parents, they will find ways and means to fulfill their basic needs. Right. Okay. So it's our aim then to seek to satisfy these needs. Correct. Yeah. Right. And it's in our genes, uh, all these basic needs. So understanding our basic needs gives us the option of knowing what can be done in order to fulfill that need. Uh, yeah. Okay, and so uh, where does, uh, you know, I'd like to pick up an earlier point that you made about internal motivation, because mm. you mentioned so much about, um, I suppose, external uh, needs, and a lot of these needs we can't control, right? I mean, mm. like uh, we have physiological needs that we, we, we really have to attend to no matter what we do, right? So what, what about, uh, so, so what, that leaves just that internal portion that we have control over. Mm. So what do you mean by this sort of internal motivation? Okay, I will, let's give you an example. Huh? Take our total behavior as an example, okay, which is driven by our one and our basic needs. So imagine yourself in a driver's seat of a car right now. There's four sets of wheel, the back end of the wheel and the front end of the wheel. So the back end of the wheel is your feeling and your physiology, something that you can't change because the fact that you are feeling right now, maybe feeling happy, feeling sad, uh, the mind can only hold one specific state at one time. So in that feeling of happy or sad, that, that state that you're in, you can't change it. However, the only thing that we can do is to change the way that we act and think, which is the front end of the wheel. So like a car, when you drive, when you start steering left and right, the front end of the wheel started moving, you will steer you towards the direction that you can become better by acting and thinking differently. Task would totally change your total behavior as well. Okay, so it's a matter of, I suppose, uh, shifting our emphasis from physiology and feeling mm. towards thinking and acting more proactively and consciously. Correct, yeah. And once you are able to do it easily, mm -hmm. it becomes uh, unconsciously you're able to shift on your regular pattern. Hypnotherapist Nathaniel Sears chatting with me, Eugene Lowe, there about choice theory. For more information on Nathaniel, you can go to hypnocoachsingapore.com. My conversation with Nathaniel continues in a short while on 938 Live. I'm Eugene Lowe and a slice of life R continues here on 938 Live. I'm chatting today with hypnotherapist Nathaniel Sears, who shares more about the transformational power of choice theory psychology. And he continues to tell us about how, in life, anyone can present information to us, but what's crucial is how we process and interpret that information. Take for example, earlier on when I was doing a photocopy of this, so I was in, in this shop, and uh, this lady started uh, copying 
notes for me. As she, start, as she started working on it, she realized that there were some mistakes. So she started complaining. She started uh, criticizing about, uh, uh, I, I shouldn't be getting this paper, what other options are there. So he started going into this external control mode, started uh, using this connecting way of telling me things. Uh. And when during the, the copying, there was some error, he started blaming, oh, it's not my fault, it's your fault. So at that point in time, if we are taking in by the words and the way that they say, it will also flow into that state that they are in. So rather than feeling disconnected, what I did was I practiced what we call connecting habits. I started encouraging her, it's okay, you'll be doing well. I believe that you can do well in, in what's happening. Accepting the fact that she is what she is. She will continue to complain and blame, but that's her life. I can choose to either get affected by it or I can choose to think differently mm. so by thinking differently and acted in a different way i don't get affected by her situation right okay so coming to your earlier analogy about that car right instead of being the passenger then we want to be the driver mm. right and not allow you know uh, somebody else's uh, perhaps a negative emotions feelings and actions whatever to 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 drag us you know into the same cesspool i suppose <laughs> okay. right so of course it's easier said than done I mean, and obviously we we know of uh you know the what what are the impact the negative impacts of being such a person they described that lady right mm. can you tell, give us in more detail elaborate perhaps what this sort of uh behavior does to people you know people who ha, uh, have very dis uh how to say disconnecting sort of uh, like this lady for example mm. you know i suppose many of us can identify with that right something offensive happens Burns or whatever, you know, we can't go, we have to go for late lunch and we're hungry, things like that, and we get upset. All it's very natural, right? So, yeah. so what, what, hap- what, what, what does this do to us, you know, as human beings in the long run? Okay, when you, uh, when the subject or anyone who practices this connecting habit, um, socially, you will start affecting the relationship with the people around us. And if you have someone who constantly nags at you, started complaining, criticizing you, you don't want to be near this person. So after a while, you'll feel uh, very away from, you get pushed around, and subsequently, you go into this alone state. Now, for what we can do as a choice theory practitioner, in that sense, we start looking at ways to help individuals, even ourselves, to practice the connecting habits. Now, the seven disconnecting habits are very simple. includes criticizing, blaming, complaining, nagging, threatening, punishing, of course, and not forgetting, rewarding to control, like bribing. As you know, when you bribe, at a certain point, you begin to rise in figure. Mm. Reaching a certain point, you can't take it anymore. What do you do? You got to think of ways to get out from there. Yeah. So these are seven of the disconnecting habits which uh, Glasser talked about. Mm, Sounds like a toxic relationship, right? The typical type of, uh, yeah. In Mm. order to make the relationship work, is to start practicing what we call connecting habits. And it's very simple. Uh, think of connecting habits as seven part and uh, labor in an acronym called Learn Street. L E A R N S T. All right. So simple. Now, what does Learn Street mean? The first one, L, stands for listening. Uh, you are able to listen to the subject well, understand where they are coming from, so you have learning. You have encouraging, begin to encourage the subject matter so that your relationship will grow along the way. Uh, accepting, that's A. So, like what I mentioned earlier about the lady in the photocopy, accepting them for what they are without uh, feeling bad about it. Respecting them for uh, their life, their work, and so forth. So re- R is respect. Then comes negotiating. Now, in terms of uh, time that me and my wife, uh, we spend together, sometimes we have a busy schedule at work. So we need time to spend together. One of the best ways is uh, we sit down and we negotiate the differences to make the relationship better. Uh, supporting each other along the way, that's the other one, which is learn, then followed by street, right, which is ST. And last but not least, to trust. At the end of the day, once you're able to trust someone for what they can do, they feel very motivated. So as simple as learn street, L-E-A-R-N-S-T. That's okay. It. So, so when you when you tell us about these uh, seven connecting habits, you're talking about how we can use the, these habits to, perhaps, uh, in relation to other people, also to yourself. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
So you should listen to yourself more as well. Encourage yourself, accept yourself, respect yourself, mm-hmm. negotiate yourself, support and trust yourself. I can do this because uh, it's all written down a sheet of paper that the uh, <laughs> pen has brought in. Not that I can remember everything. So, but yes, those are the things that uh, we need to learn to do as well, right? And uh, this, uh, like you mentioned earlier, um, you 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 learned in uh, over the course of two and a half years mm-hmm. in in. And you spent two and a half years there. No, uh, I spent about a week over in US right, okay. uh, with Dr. Glasser. Then the program works in such a way that you have to go through uh, basic training, then you go through months of practicum, then followed by right. an advanced training from a different trainer, which I learned from this uh, new Australian guy called Gary Gunnar, if I remember correctly. Okay. Um, so, so when you when, say practicum, it's... Yes, you uh, have to sit in with a practicum supervisor who is either... It can be a psychiatrist, psychologist, a so counsellor who it? has been doing this for years and they are actually considered as practicum supervisor. So the path to become certified takes two and a half years. Okay. And then to go to a next practicum to supervisor takes another two years or so. Right. So their job is to assess whether you are lying, is it? When you, are, <laughs> when, you <laughs> when you say, I've come to this stage where I'm able to listen and, and encourage and accept. And then right, their job is to say, no, nah, you haven't reached, quite reached it yet. Is it? It's something like that, isn't it? Not I mean, whether really. you have, not really? No. The, a practicum supervisor, what it does is very simple. It's basically to help you to understand the deeper part of choice theory. I'm Eugene Lowe on A Slice of Life R, and my chat continues now with hypnotherapist Nathaniel Sears, who has been telling me more about choice theory and how it transformed his life. In my life, I've actually gone through uh, three times where I had what you call a near-death experience. Um, at a young age of three, I was nearly thrown out the window by no. my dad. Oh, God. Okay. okay. So I've gone through the childhood traumatic experience. Right. I've also gone through what we call um, an experience where you were shot at close range by a paintball gun on the head. So I've survived that as well. And uh, the last but not least was I was actually electrocuted 440 volt. So I survived that as well. Now, Glasser mentioned that uh, we did not need to be victims of our past unless we choose to be so. Even though I may have experienced different type of experience in my life, be it traumatic experience, physical experience, or whatsoever uh, that limits me from what I am, it also gave me the choice to decide what I want to do. And as I progressively learn about how choice works, about how I, what are the wants, what are, what are my basic needs, I began to go deeper into it and by practicing it regularly with my then girlfriend, who now is my wife, <laughs> we we gone through understanding and growth along the way as well. And she's not choice trained, but uh, in turn of me practicing what I've learned from this system, we help each other along the way and we, we become closer. Mm, she has something even better, a real life example. Yes. <laughs> of that happening every day. Correct. Right? Yeah. And uh, of course, we wouldn't want to wish any near-death experiences on anybody, but we often find that it is through those experiences that really give us that that eureka moments, right? Mm. And and uh, we find that when we survive, of course, we sur- you know it's important to survive those things. Mm. Uh, once you survive that, then you get a very powerful realization of what you want to do with your life. Your, 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 it becomes crystallizes your your fo- your priorities, your 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 life choices all the more, right? Correct. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So an important thing is to allow actually any sort of um, misfortune or whatever you call it. I mean, the scale will differ, extent will be different, but whatever happens to you that you may perceive as unfortunate, to use that to help you to create a better life. Yes. At the end of the day, once you know that you always have a choice, um, I always use this phrase uh, that you are always you always have a choice uh, when you are in a crossroad even by choosing not to choose, it's also a choice. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, uh, that's that's something that uh, uh, some people, I mean, some of us don't, don't realize, right? That uh, staying inert or staying immobile mm. is still making, uh, it's still acting, really. Yep. Yeah? And at times by, by choosing not to choose, uh, things flow by you so fast that you miss certain opportunity, um, 
we have been talking about uh, feeling grateful for things that uh, that we can do. And that's the reason why by practicing choice theory, I started also coming up with this thing called uh, Choice uh, More on the Basis of great, Grateful Workbook. So the concept of the workbook, uh, workbook is very simple. Each night before you sleep, because you're, when you're in that state where you're about to fall asleep, your subconscious are more heightened. Start writing uh, things on your book that you can have every day on what you are grateful for. Uh, be it you're grateful for having someone buy you a cup of coffee for a day, being grateful for having uh, earned a million bucks. It can be anything that you are grateful for. Grateful uh, for not have, uh, being thrown out of a window uh, when yeah, you were three. That's true. You know, obviously, yeah. there's so many things really, right? Correct. And, and you know what that does also is to kind of like relax you. Mm. You know, so many of us find it difficult to sleep because we're so anxious, right? You know, we're Correct. so stressed out just before we go to bed and then we're like, <laughs> oh no, what if I can't sleep? What if I'm thinking about the meeting tomorrow? All that sort of thing. Mm. And it just makes us all the more sleepless. So what this does also is to calm us down. Right. Yeah. On top of that, you can also, uh, what I did was I add another part, another element to this workbook is to add this thing called your gain, your positive gain. In what sense? Now, it can be any form of gain. It can be, for example, you gain a new friend, uh, you gain someone buying you maybe a, a, set, a set of flowers. It can be anything that you can gain. Now, even though on that day you may be having a lousy day, like let's say your boss breathing down your neck, uh, you just lost uh, your wallet with uh, thousands of dollars on it, it can be anything on that. But as you begin to focus on what you can gain positively, sometimes like um, that day I was, I, I was going for a talk and I lost my tie. It's a brand new tie. So what are the, the gains I get from there is when I went for a talk, I gained people who respect me for what I am. They listen to what I can share for, to them. At the same time, they begin to realize that there are other areas that they can bring me to share the system with. Yeah. Mm. So it started flowing. Correct. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you can't get, get back what you've lost, right? Very often, and then when you're getting upset over it, it just makes it all the worse, you know? And then, and, and then when you keep doing that, you, you, you lose even more because, you know, your focus is on what you lost, you get upset, you, you snap at people, people think you're crazy, <laughs> and then it's just, just, it's just it's a chain reaction, right? But then when you start focusing on, in spite of this, you know, thing that I can't even do anything about anymore, mm-hmm. let me try and gain something from this, right? Correct. And that, that, that reminds me also from about this uh, example that I read in a book, uh, in a book somewhere about this, this when you go to a restaurant and you, you, you order a steak or something and it comes like, you know, undercooked, overcooked, charred or whatever, right? And then mm-hmm. you kick up a big fuss, you get angry, you, 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 you uh, snap at the waiter and things like that. What happens? You know, the waiter goes in, probably spits <laughs> onto the steak or something, you know, and then brings it back. And then, you know, it, but but if you were to say, um, you know, speak, talk in a very nice way, explain, mm. explain the situation, you know, you, you will get a better steak, yes. you know, maybe complimentary meal or something like that. So, so make it happen, make, make yourself gain from any sort of experience. Mm, yeah. That's great, yeah. Mm, I mean, if you look at this as an example, I was, uh, I signed up for a, a broadband package months back, okay, um, and I couldn't get my, my thing, uh, the signal that I need. So it took me weeks and months to going back to the telco to try to get it to work. So the manager was very nice. If I were to scream and shout at them, what happens is I won't get things done. Mm. So it took me uh, weeks and months by just simply going through one stage, second stage, and clearing up all the possible problems there is there to finally get to the outcome that I want. And the main goal is to get your what you want working, but you also gain a friend. It's win-win, right? I mean, then it's less stress. <laughs> no high blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Learn to breathe more. <laughs> that will work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Make friends instead of enemies, right? Yeah. Hypnotherapist Nathaniel Sears chatting with me there. For more information on Nathaniel, go to hypnocoachsingapore.com. I'm Eugene Lowe and A Slice of Life R continues in a few minutes with a post by motivational speaker and author Zaibun Siraj from her blog about how love is a mini splendid thing as well as one of my favourite love songs. Stay with us on 938 Live. I'm Eugene Lowe and A Slice of Life R continues now on 938 Live. In the meaningful media part of the show, I'd like to share the latest post on this marvellous blog, Zaibun.com, by motivational speaker and author Zaibun Siraj. And she writes about how love is a mini-splendid thing. She says, February 
is the month for love, and hence, in this post, I discuss the importance of love and why we should all cultivate love with love in our hearts for ourselves, for our partners, our parents, our immediate and extended family members, our friends, our neighbors, our colleagues, our community. Our fellow citizens, citizens of other countries, our country, and so on, we can achieve happiness and peace in this world. We will tolerate one another's differences and accept each other's religion, traditions, and culture. There will be harmony, and there will be goodwill. People will treat each other with respect, and they will not be violent and cruel to others. Love brings with it kindness. Compassion and helpfulness. If we have love in us, we are able to respond well to people and make them happy. The loving person cares for others, is considerate of the needs of others, and will make much effort to assist others. Such a person too is generous with his or her time, energy, words, and money. He or she is willing to reach out to others, not just in times of crisis. But all the time, with love, we can understand and help others get over the suffering and the agony that they're experiencing. Love helps us to achieve greater understanding with each other. It brings us closer to people, and our sense of belonging is developed. We will not feel isolated, and will feel good about ourselves, about others, and about the world. This prompts us to achieve and to work well for others. We react positively to everything, and we reject negativity and fear. We feel confident about life, about ourselves, and about others. We believe that we count and that we are valuable. The loving person is motivated to do good work and will influence others to do good work as well. When we love others, we are vibrant and vivacious. When others love us, we feel secure, appreciated, and wonderful. We feel confident to undertake great tasks, pursue new paths, and chart new directions. We help to make the world a better place. When you have love in you, you will recognize that others need love too. Give love to others, even strangers. Make them feel good, so they too will be motivated to perform well. Many writers have rated love as the most important of all values. Some believe that we cannot live without love. It is as vital as oxygen. A world without love is one which is barren, cold, and unfriendly. Some writers see love as life's greatest blessing. It enriches our life and it brings significance and meaning to our relationships. You cannot have love without commitment. This is what makes love rich and binding. The commitment, though, does not just happen; it needs to be developed. Whether it is with a partner or your friends, with colleagues or with family members, you need to nurture and develop the love that you have for each other. Now, there are many ways to nurture and develop love, and Zaibun suggests the following: one good way to develop love is to speak kindly to everyone, avoid belittling and insulting others, use praise often, and find ways to encourage and motivate others. It helps too to overlook small irritations and annoying acts and not react to them. When you make a mistake, be quick to admit your fault or error. Do not make excuses. There is nothing worse in a relationship than for one person to try to manipulate the other, so as to get something. It is also not right to be deceitful to each other. Practice honesty. Always encourage each other in what each one does. Give each other support. Be interested in any project in which the other person is involved. Offer assistance, even. It's very important to show appreciation to others. Tell each other how much you love and care for them. Thank people for their friendship. Respect each other and be courteous. This will keep the love and the friendship alive and vital. Every day, you should make a commitment to develop your love for others. Practice patience and work to enhance the love. Think of the other person and be willing to give up some things and even make sacrifices. Trust each other. When you make a promise to do something, make sure that you keep the promise. Be responsible for what you say and what you do. Laugh with each other often. This binds you to each other, and you can work and cooperate with one another better. Smile at each other and hug one another often. Thank you, Zai Boon, for writing that wonderful article,、uh, which is her latest post on her blog, Zai Boon dot com. Do check it out at z a i b u n dot com. Saturday.
So.